Hello and welcome. Joining me today to share the stories behind the 10 books that impacted him the most on his globetrotting life journey is philosophical traveller, recovering malcontent, and New York Times bestselling author Eric Weiner, whose wryly incisive observations and hilarious self-deprecating humour have seen his books translated into 24 languages. A former foreign correspondent for NPR, Eric Weiner's books include the critically acclaimed Man Seeks God, My Flirtations with the Divine, The Geography of Bliss, One Grump's Search for the Happiest Places in the World, which was an Amazon Best Book of 2016, The Geography of Genius, and his most recent work, The Socrates Express, in search of life lessons from dead philosophers. And if those titles don't tell you enough about Eric Weiner, you need to know that he is so deeply enamoured with books that even in this modern age of Audible and Kindle, he insists on lugging at least one extra suitcase on his travels, packed with around 20 books that he couldn't possibly leave behind. Eric Weiner, welcome. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Sandy. Happy to be with you. So when did this intense love affair with books begin for you, Eric? You know, I can't remember a time when I was not in love with books. Um, I, I, d despite my uh, world traveling habit, I actually am more of an introvert. And I think, like many introverts, I feel comfortable with a book and in some ways more comfortable with a good book than a person, um, depending on the person and on the book. Um, so for as long as I can remember, uh, I've loved books and readings and reading and um yeah my attempt at going digital with the kindle with just you know i tell people i used to travel with 20 books then i bought a kindle and now i travel with 20 books and a kindle so <laughs> i'm not saving any weight but yeah that's me i do understand that i didn't think i would ever give up hard copies um and the kindle did tempt me but i thought no until i found that i can get thousands on my kindle that did it right. i'm afraid right yeah. So let's talk about your 10 best books, the books that inspired you the most on your life journey and the number one on your list. And I don't think this is chronological, is it? It's not in order that you read. No, it. it's uh, I would call it a random order. It's in random order. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the first one is Waiting for God by the renowned philosopher and social activist Simone Weil. And that was published in 1950. Yes. Um so Simone Vey, it's actually pronounced Vey. Vey, ah, well, I, which, I checked and every every single one said while. So Yeah, um, well, I, she, I, I, I did my homework and she is French and so it's pronounced Vey. It doesn't look like it should be. But um, anyway, um, however you pronounce it, uh, she's a remarkable person. She was born... Uh, shortly after the turn of the 20th century uh, in Paris um, to sort of hyper-intellectual Jewish parents. She became a kind of wonderkin and philosopher um, who got into the Sorbonne at a, at a ridiculously young age, uh, one of the few women to do so. Um, but she is deeply spiritual and unusual in a lot of ways. She really writes about uh, attention uh, a lot. And in attention and waiting, I would say, patience and attention. And uh, for her, she she equates attention and love. And she suggests that they are one and the same. And then if we we're giving her full, complete attention to a person, that's absolutely equivalent to loving them. And that what we really want from others is not their love per se, which can be a squishy concept, to be honest, but their, their attention. And, and children are, are really expert at, at spotting counterfeit attention. You know, a six-year-old or a 10-year-old, they, they, they can tell when, when you're pretending to pay attention, when you're really mm -hmm. checking your phone at the same time. So, um, so th this book, Waiting for God, is an anthology of her writing. Um, she died way too young. Um, I think she was in, in her late 30s. Um, she had health issues. Um, she went to England. Uh, to uh, Kent, where she, um, you know, she was trying to 
be active in the war effort and spent some time in London. So she died young. It was a tragic life, but her writing is still with us, and I'm grateful for that. So do you remember when you read the book? Well, I write about her in my most recent book, The Socrates Express. She's one of the dead philosophers that we can learn from. But I was aware of her before that. I mean, probably 20 years ago, she was on my radar. Uh, and I had dipped into this book. But when I was researching her for my book on these philosophers, I, I dove much deeper. I read several biographies of her life and got a better sense of, of where she was coming from philosophically and spiritually. Because you, you mentioned, you know, the attention thing and attention being love. And attention, I would say, that's what you do. I mean, you pay attention. Your observations are so detailed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's funny you should say that because I also consider myself an impatient man in a lot of ways. <clears throat> but what I like about what I do for a living writing these books is I get paid to pay attention. And... Uh, and it forces me to pay attention. In other words, I travel with a purpose. Mm. And I think that that makes me just zero in, you know, um, like, wh where are you speaking to me from today, may I ask? Um, England. Um, it's oh. south of England. South the of other England. side of London from Slough. Okay. So <laughs> you're on the posh side. So if I were to, um, you know, go to your town or village, I, I know I only have so much time there. And I want to really pay attention, but build in enough extra time to loiter and linger. I'm a big fan of loitering. And that's one of the reasons I made this transition from a journalist to, to book writer, is it allows me to pay attention more, to dive deeper into mm. to linger and not just do sort of drive-by interviews. Mm. Do you think that, um, I mean, were you surprised by that? what you said about attention or had it not occurred to you before that this it, is something it, it, that's really important for you? You know, I, I think whenever we, we read something that resonates with us and we underline it, I'm a big underliner. I think there's an element of self-recognition in that, that we, the, the author has said what we've been thinking in inchoate ways, but says it better than we've been thinking it. So it clicks. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's, Probably as we go through this list, it's probably true for almost all of these uh, authors and spiritual teachers is I, I'm like, yeah, I, I knew that. But you, you said it better and you took it to another level. So that's where I would put Simone Weil's theory of attention into that category. Something I knew, but I hadn't really thought it through. And she thought it through for me. So I underline. Hmm. So book number two, Bhagavad Gita, according to Gandhi by Mahatma Gandhi. Why that particular version? Well, I am an unabashed Gandhi fan. Uh, I lived in India for several years. I, um, I don't say I went through a phase, but I'm still in the phase. I, I admire him as a person, as a leader, as a writer. Um, I think he's, his lessons are still very relevant today. And the Bhagavad Gita is, of course, the, the Hindu spiritual poem. It's actually pretty compact if you just look at the Gita, it's not that many pages, uh, written anonymously. We don't know who wrote it. Um, but Gandhi called it um, his, it, it was what he turned to during difficult times. And God knows he had plenty of difficult times. He said he would turn to his mother Gita, as he called it, and find um, spiritual succor there, comfort, lessons, courage. Um, and in this book, the Gita, according to Gandhi, um, it's probably, I suspect it came from a series of lectures. It reads like that, but it's his commentaries on the Gita. And there's one lesson that he and others have drawn from the spiritual poem that I like, which, you know, it's Lord Krishna, who's, you know, um, disguised as a charioteer, who's speaking to Arjun, who's about to go into battle and doesn't know whether he has the courage to do it. And and what Krishna says to uh, Arjun is essentially put 100% effort into what you're doing, but have precisely 0% invested in the results. And uh, that's good advice. It's very hard to follow. But, um, you know, when, when we're taking on a project, writing a book, I can't control the outcome. I can't control how the book's going to be received. All I can control is the, the effort I put into it. Um, so I think that is a, 
a good recipe for happiness. And I, I think Gandhi addresses that here. You refer to him as spiritually omnivorous. Is that a term that you would apply to yourself? Yes, I would. Um, I'll, 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 you know, I don't care what uh, language wisdom speaks. I don't care how it dresses. I don't care about its gender. And I don't care about its age. It can be from yesterday or from 3,000 years ago. Um, so, you know, you never know where you might find wisdom. And, you know, I think there's a tendency um, in our culture to sort of say, you know, that kind of person is spiritual if they're wearing an Indian kurta and their shaved head, you know, but someone in a suit and tie, well, they're not spiritual. But you never know. Sometimes wisdom wears a suit and tie. Um, and Gandhi took that approach. He, you know, he, he, would dip into Christianity. He read Tolstoy on Christianity. Um, he was well versed in in Islam, um, but he would in, in the Jains that that religious group. He would certainly one of his teachers was Jain, but he would return to the Gita. So I think it's good to be spiritually omnivorous, but you, you need to have your staple dishes that you return to over and over again, and then you add side dishes and dessert and things like that. Interesting that you're using the food analogy because I was just thinking that, um, you know, I wasn't familiar with many of the titles on your list. That's good. So I, 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 I checked into them and <laughs> yes. I, I could, you know, I've been eating my way through your books ever since I've discovered them mm. with great gusto, I must say. Um, and I can see you in every single one of these books. I can see little aspects. As, oh. Ah, yeah, I can see why you like it. I hadn't thought of that. Um, it was a, a bit of a challenge coming up with the list and narrowing it down. And um, but I think you're right. And when I when I looked at the finished product, the list, um, I thought, well, yeah, that's you know, I sort of came up with the right the right books, I think, for this conversation, and and that represent me. So that's a good point. Did you? I mean, it is a difficult task, especially <laughs> someone who reads as many books as you do. Um, did you uh, choose them by? The number of underlinings in those books? Well, I chose them by the ones that, that stayed sort of front and center on, on the, my primary bookshelf as opposed to some of my secondary bookshelves or the annex book. You know, I have levels of bookshelves. Um, and I, I chose it by ones that, that spoke to me and then I returned to that, not just, I don't just read them and put them down. Um, you know, I also I wanted to have a diverse collection here of, you know, a little bit of poetry, a little bit of fiction, a little bit of East, a little bit of West. So I did keep that in mind as well. Um, but there, there are no dogs here. They're all, they're all good. Mm. Well, book number three is Invisible Cities by, and you can correct my pronunciation if you like, Italo Calvino. Beautiful. Bonissimo. <laughs> um, that's how you pronounce it. And this is this is a book I, I get excited about still. I, I, you, I teach writing courses, in travel writing, writing about place, and I always use this book as sort of an example to get to get people's imagination flowing. Um, it's a really odd book in a lot of ways. It's technically fiction, but I wouldn't call it a novel because there's no plot or storyline. It's essentially, and imagine Marco Polo, who has just traveled the world, as Marco Polo did, and is returning to his benefactor, Kubla Khan, as Polo did, except instead of recounting tales to, you know, Hangzhou in China, where Polo went, he's talking about imaginary cities, invisible cities. And each entry, and there are about 50 of them, is short, from paragraph to maybe a page and a half, Two pages at the most. And he describes these cities that are just where the laws of physics have been suspended, where maybe after a, at the end of each day, the next day starts fresh and people have no memory of the previous day. A city where instead of people walking through air, they're walking through dirt. Um, and he plays on ideas like memory and connections. And it's difficult to describe without reading it, but it reads like poetry, even though it's prose. And it is, to me, what the spiritual life and the life of a traveler both should be like, which is to imagine life 
as if it were otherwise. Um, I think that's the point of good travel writing. That's the point of good spiritual writing, to imagine life as if it were otherwise. And that's what Calvino does and in a very concise way. So it's a good lesson in the, the power of brevity, if, if, in, in addition to many other things. Mm. You said that um, each city represents a thought experiment, or as Calvino writes, you take delight not in a city's seven or 70 wonders, but in the answer it gives to a question of yours, which is exactly what you're seeking and finding in the cities and countries that you travel to. Yes, and what Calvino does is uh, gives you the answer to a question you didn't know you were asking, or twists the question, you know. Mm. And uh, and I, I like in my writing to question assumptions, to ask uh, sometimes the obvious question, you know, like, okay, we we want to get a job and make money. Why, you know, um, we uh, measure uh, the progress of a nation in gross domestic product. Why? Um, why not gross national happiness as they do in Bhutan? So um, again, I think it's the the mind of a of a traveler and of a spiritual seeker. You know, my my favorite uh, all time favorite quote about travel, which applies to spirituality just as equally, is from the American writer Henry Miller. He said, One, "One's destination is never a place, but a new way of looking at things," and and that's what Calvino does beautifully here. It gives us a new way of looking at things. Yeah. And, and what I try to do in my writing as well. Yeah. Book four is a book that addresses the issues confronting every man and woman. It's Commentaries on Living by Krishnamurti, which was published in 1956. Now, I suspect he may be one of the authors you're familiar with, uh, yes. at least a bit. Um, and I first read Krishnamurti I, when I was young. I was a teenager. And um, I was smitten by him and confused by him um, because he is philosophy stripped bare. You know, it's just, there's no jargon. There's no spiritual jargon. Um, there's not spirituality as you normally think of it. It's, it's what we were just talking about, questioning assumptions. He's really questioning assumptions and he probably asked well what do i mean by questioning assumptions and and how much of our thinking is really conditioned thinking um what would he in a nutshell what i say chris namarty is doing for us to us for us with us is uh to show us how little of what we think every day is I would say organic to us, how it, we're just repeating mm -hmm. things we've heard, we've been conditioned in sort of way, certain ways, and he tries sort of relentlessly pushing you to strip away this conditioning. And I find I can only read him for so long or, or listen to his lectures and I have to take a break because my head starts to hurt because there's a certain comfort in, in being a bit on autopilot and, and going through life like that. Um, there's a reason that we're not all Krishnamurti. Um, it's, it's a hard life, mm. but rewarding, I'd like to think, yeah. And you said that um, this is a book that should be read slowly. Is that because it kind of twists your mind a bit? Yeah, there's, it, it, you're not absorbing um, content. You're not reading it for information. You're reading it to change the way you think. And that has to be done slowly. <laughs> um, and you need to not say, okay, I've got that, I've underlined that, I'm going to move on. You've got to really sit with it. So, yes, slowly. I mean, I think any, you know, a good book should be read slowly anyway, but especially him. But you also said it about the next book, which was My Bright Abyss, Meditation of a Modern Believer by poet and editor of Poetry Magazine, Christian Wyman. Yes, very good. You're, you're doing great. I mean, he, um, he is a poet, and I love to write, to read poets when they're writing prose. I find this very instructive as a writer, because they maintain that musicality of poetry, um, but they do it in prose form, and they tend to be very um, concise and um, pack a lot into each word, and, and that's what uh, Christian Wyman does here. 
Now he he is a, a cancer survivor, um, and but he doesn't dwell on that, and there's no self pity here. And I wouldn't exactly say that's what the book is about. The book is about faith and about Christian faith and about God, and he uses the G word in a way that other spiritual writers don't. They sort of shy away from it, um, and, um, and and it, it sort of falls into that category somewhat that I think my writing on spirituality does. It's somewhere between a true believer and a someone who's just rejecting religion out of hand. He's, he's wrestling with his faith. He's struggling with it on each page. And so he has what I call earned epiphanies. Um, if he reaches an epiphany, you know, he's, he's arrived at through the physical pain of his cancer or through wrestling with faith and um, lots of underlining took place in this book. Mm. Yeah, and I think I know what you mean about the, the rhythm of words. Um, you know, there are some books that ha they could be poetry. They are so rhythmic, and it's a delight to read those books. Yeah, and and um, and and each word is purposeful and is yes. is doing some work. There's just no yeah. excess. Yeah. 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 So book number six is The Sabbath, It's Meaning for Modern Man by Joshua Abraham Heschel, published in 1951. I love this book as well. Um, also a slim book, seems to be a theme here. I think that, um, you know, after I submit my manuscript, my editor, God bless him, um, engages in what he calls editorial liposuction and uh, just <laughs> sucks out all the fat <laughs> and... <laughs> And he says, uh, you know, I think this will be a, a fitter, trimmer version of your book. And I'm like, well, can you do the same thing for my body, actually, while you're <laughs> at it? <laughs> but uh, this is also, a, you know, a slim, less than 200-page book about one idea, about the, the Jewish Sabbath. But really, it's about more than that. And you don't need to be Jewish, certainly, to read this book. I happen to be born Jewish, but... Um, anyone could get a lot out of it. He calls the Sabbath a, a sanctuary in time. And I love that. Um, you know, we seek sanctuary in places all the time. You know, we, we try to go on a big holiday or to, you know, escape from ourselves to, you know, find the right place to write. And we're looking, we're always looking for little place sanctuaries. And, and what he's suggesting here is that this day of rest is a sanctuary in time. Um, a place, not just to recharge your batteries, that's too facile, or to, to really reconnect with yourself, you know. And of course, that means disconnecting with technology and with distraction. Um, I don't think you need to, uh, you know, some Orthodox Jews take it, I'll say, to an extreme, but who's to say what an extreme is? They, they have a, a maximalist view of the Sabbath, which is, you know, no electronics at all, um, certainly not driving the car, um, not carrying anything, even not carrying a bag or anything like that. Um, but I, I have a, a friend, Yossi, um, a deeply spiritual Jewish man who lives in Israel, and he came up with his own rules. And he, he said he did it the, the maximalist way for a while, and it was he was just worried about breaking the rules too much. So he he drew the boundaries somewhere else where I think, you know, no electronics, but he can carry things and he can do this or that. And I think that's the, the spirit of the Sabbath, you know, not the letter of it is that you've carved out this space in time for yourself. Did you read that book before or after you wrote Man Seeks God? I think during. During. during yeah. yeah i think because you actually some... had that experience didn't you with your friend where he was talking to you about time and it was it was one of those you know for me it was one of those i have to stop and think about that and it changed yeah. something in me changed yes I, I met um some kabbalists in in spot in northern israel and and uh, we observed the Sabbath with a walking meditation, you know, um, why not? And uh, complete silence. So there are all kinds of ways of carving out your own sanctuary in time. And, um, you know, you can, you can create your own rituals. I don't think rituals are, you know, the, the shortcut way is here's the ritual. This is the way it's been done for thousands of years. But somebody had to invent the ritual in the first place. And, and they're, you know, they're, uh, they're modified as the centuries go on. So 
I think there's nothing wrong with creating your own rituals and they can be completely secular rituals. For me, it's making coffee the slow way and pouring over and grinding the beans and it takes forever, but the coffee tastes better. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. Book seven, The Perennial Philosophy by Aldous Huxley, 1944. Yes, uh, not the thinnest book, um, and a, a sprawling book. So he's best known, Huxley, as, of course, the author of Brave New World. But he had a whole nother existence. <laughs> um, you know, he wrote other novels. He was an early participant in, let's call them experiments with hallucinogenics. Um and also, also an early advocate, I believe, of Vedanta philosophy, along with Christopher Isherwood and, and other people like that. Um, but this is, is, is an odd book also because it's, it's a lot of little excerpts from various spiritual traditions. And he'll quote, you know, from these sources or paragraph or long paragraphs. But he's he's building a case, you know, that in the case is that basically um, there's been this perennial philosophy that, by the, as the name suggests, has always been with us, um, and that it appears in Eastern traditions and Western traditions, and um, it's not any one thing. It's hard to describe, but that he, he's just finding patterns for us, and because he's spiritually omnivorous, also. Yeah. He's looking everywhere. So mm -hmm. on one page, you know, you might be reading Thomas Merton. On the next page, you know, you're, you're reading Gandhi or whatever. It, it, it's, and he goes back much further than that. So um, it's, a, it's a sort of compilation of spirituality's greatest hits, I would say. It's the mixed tape, um, but with a, a theme, like all great mixed tapes, it has a, a theme running through it. Mm. And again, very much like you in that he is looking at everything. He's looking everywhere. Yeah. And I don't know if he wrote this before or after he tried the magic mushrooms, but um, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's good. No. Okay. So book number eight is Callings, Finding and Following an Authentic Life by Greg Levoy, published in the 70s. Yeah, I stumbled across this book. I think all great books you stumble upon, they sort of find you. Um, when I was, um, I was quite young. I was trying, I was in my 20s. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I found he, he took the, takes the idea of callings very seriously. And, um, and unlike a lot of self-help books about career advice, you know, just sort of follow your dream, your passion. He really digs into the, the, the mythology. And I use that in the myth in the positive sense here, the myth of callings in this hero's journey and how, you know, you've got this life. It matters is what he's essentially grabbing you by the collar and saying that. And, you know, I, 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 you know, I read it a long time ago. Um, somehow it must have stayed with me because it popped up on the list. And because I think I have found my calling, um, um, when I was a foreign correspondent with National Public Radio, I was almost doing the thing that I really should be doing with my life. But the difference between almost doing what you should do and doing what you should do is, to paraphrase Mark Twain, like the difference between the lightning bug and lightning. There's a big difference. So with this book in mind, I made the leap about 12 years ago from a journalist to full-time author and seeker and philosophical traveler and recovering malcontent and all those other things. So this book had an effect on me. So, so that this was pivotal really in that decision. It was, I can't point to any one time or any one page number yeah. or, or in this Tipping book, point. but, but the, the, yeah, the idea of it, that, that, um, that we have a calling and that we don't, it's not just that we have to listen for it, but we also in a way have to create it and manifest it. It's not enough to just heed the call. You have to, in a way, like make the call yourself yeah. and then, and then answer it. <clears throat> and now that you've made that call and have been very successful doing it, are you satisfied with that? Or is there something else that's calling you? 
I don't know if I'll ever be satisfied. It's not in my nature. <laughs> um, uh, you know, my last name is pronounced Weiner. We must keep that in mind. Um, I prefer the W-I-N-E. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my daughter would. Too, that kind but, of Weiner. But I can't. Yeah, that's true. That's true. There are different ways you can look at it. Mm. Um, am I satisfied? Yeah, on one level, I know that I'm doing what I should be doing. Um, but I, I still have the neuroses about projects. They're, they're big, sprawling projects. They take years to complete. And, you know, I, I keep coming back to that from the Bhagavad Gita, 100% invested in the project, 0% yeah. yeah. invested in the results. It's when we invest so much in the results that we make ourselves unhappy. And I'm, I still wrestle with that. But in terms of callings, no, I absolutely know that I, you know, made the right decision. I, I see the reports from Ukraine. It's terrible what's happening there. And some friends of mine who used to be foreign correspondents, they're just, you know, chomping at the bit. They want to go there and cover the story. And I, I've i lost that that desire. God bless the people, the journalists who are there. They're doing important work and, and I'm doing what I should be doing. Well, I'm glad you are. And it seems to me from reading your books that you're having great fun doing it. And I'm having, you know, great fun. Um, reading about you're doing it it's got to be fun i mean if it's not fun why bother um and exactly. and what i what i try to do is to not to you know criticize academics some of them are quite good but often an academic writer will take a simple idea and make it complicated i try to like take complicated ideas and make them simple without oversimplifying them that's that's the trick and i try to cut to the essence of whether it's a philosopher's teacher or what makes a place tick or what makes a culture tick. Um, and I look for portholes uh, into a place. Um, and you know, the most obvious portal is, is, is food. Food has come up a few times here, but there are less obvious ones too. You can, you know, you can tell a lot about all oh, the British, you know, by, um, by the way they cross the street. You know, and uh, the way they queue, uh, and the way um, you know, if you bump into a an English person on the street and you bump in rather aggressively, they'll always apologize to you for for you bumping into them. You know, no matter what, you could just body block them, and they're like, "Oh, I'm sorry." Um, <clears throat> anyway, I don't know how we got off on this tangent, but that that tells you something about the culture, and yeah. and so I'm looking. That's why I love to travel is it gives you, it gives me something to take these ideas and to hook them onto, you know, and ground them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on to book number nine, which is the philosophies of Asia by Alan Watts. And this is a collection, isn't it? Of his lectures that was uh, it, it compiled is. by his son. And it's, um, cause he did a lot more, uh, talking than writing, but he talked very well. Um, and this is actually, you know, about, um, you know, Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism sort of just speaks to what I was just talking about. He condenses these religions to their essence and in a way that's relatable to you. And, you know, from reading this, that Alan Watts knows a lot more about, say, Taoism, the Chinese religion, than he's putting on the page. And I believe the writer should always know more than they put on the page. If they're putting all their work on the page, that's, they're not doing their job. Um, so I like to think in, in Watts's books and in mine, there's, you, you're, you can read it and you know that there's a lot that went into that, that epiphany or that, that statement. Um, so he's, you know, he was, a guru, a guru's guru of the 60s and I think early 70s. He died fairly young. Um, he, I think, liked to drink and liked women. He was one of those gurus, but he also uh, is wise on the page uh, and in his lectures. And, um, you know, this was, he became interested in Zen in the 50s. And that's before... You could walk down to your local bookshop and find, you know, an Eastern thought section or New Age section. And I really am fascinated by these people like Huxley, like Watts, like Christopher Isherwood, Somerset Maugham in his book, The Razor's Edge, who 
were really like the first people to discover the teachings of Buddhism or Hinduism. Um, you know, I think we're going to talk about Henry David Thoreau in a second, but he also, you know, in the 19th century, 1850s, wow. he's reading the Bhagavad Gita in his cabin. And uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, the German philosopher, even earlier, you know, is uh, reading the Upanishads, like one of the first translations, translated from Sanskrit to uh, Latin to French. It just went through like several translations by the time he got it. And you wonder like, wow. <laughs> but these people who were early adapters to Eastern thought, I almost often think, I wish I was born back then and could there were still worlds to explore. That would have been something. Yeah, that would have been something indeed. And the last book is Thoreau's Journal, yeah. 1851. So um, here in the U.S., Thoreau is uh, thrust upon us, often in high school or middle school, with his book Walden, uh, which every American school kid knows something about at least, which is that he went off to Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, just outside of town, built a cabin and tried to um, confront the facts of life rather than finding out he had never really lived, to paraphrase his, his famous line. And it's an experiment. Um, lately, he's gotten some bad publicity because it you know turns out that he uh, was not so far from town, and he would go walk 20 minutes into town two or three times a week, have his mother do his laundry, pick up some baking, uh, home-baked goods. But I, I think people are too hard on him. He, he never pretended it was anything other than an experiment. He has a chapter called Visitors. People did come and visit him. And it's the thing is, it's often seen, Walton is often seen as... Um, and Thoreau is seen as, as, you know, a book, a person that's writing about simplicity or self-reliance. But the more I dug into him and got beyond Walden, which is, has a bit of artifice to it, it's, he's very self-aware as he's writing, and got into his journals, I mean, you know, just thousands and thousands of pages, I think it's like in 10, 11 volumes, this is sort of his best year what was it, 1851? Um, this is, uh, yes, this is what the editors decided. This was sort of the quintessential Thoreau. And what I discovered is um, he's more likable, I think, in the journals. He's more honest. You know, if you keep a journal or a diary, you don't necessarily think someone's going to read it. So it's a conversation you're having with yourself. And you, you're, then as a reader, you're sort of eavesdropping on someone having a conversation with themselves. And that's what Thoreau's doing here. And what I discovered is, it's not really about simplicity and solitude and nature. That's part of it. It's really about perception. It's about seeing. So the journal and Thoreau's writing is really about um, cleansing your lens of perception so you can see more clearly. So he would examine and, and look at Walden Pond, for instance, from every different angle. He would even turn his head upside down and look between his legs at the inverted pond just to see it a bit differently. I did try this myself and all the blood rushed to my head and I almost passed out, but I'm not Thoreau. Um, so um, so that's really what I think you get out of this. We talked about paying attention in the very beginning of this conversation. And this is what Thoreau does beautifully is he pays attention. And he, he that requires slowing down and taking your time. And um, he had lots of time on his hands because he, he really just observes nature, observes himself, um, and um, will mix up his routine now and then, take a different path one day, just and then see something differently. And, and we often get into ruts, we get into visual ruts too, where we just, we see something we, that's always in a field of vision every day, and we see it, but we don't see it. And what happens when you travel is you have a heightened sense of perception. So that's why people say they often say they feel more alive on the road. Yeah. It's, not, it's because they they have a heightened sense of per perception, number one. And number two is they're giving themselves permission to be slightly different, to be someone else when they're traveling. <clears throat> Thoreau accomplished that without really leaving the town of Concord in, in his life. Just a few trips to New York, which he hated. No surprise there. 
and up to Maine and Canada once, I, I think. If you could um, meet any one of these authors that we've been discussing, which one would it be? Oh, could I have a dinner party and invite them all? I mean... Only if you invite me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's a tough one. Well, I, I would... Yeah, I don't think any are... I'm not sure about Greg. I don't think any are still... Candy? Um, yeah. <clears throat> you read my mind. I think Gandhi would be number one, um, followed by Thoreau, um, followed by Krishnamurti, followed by Calvino. Yeah, I could see four guests. Those would be the four guests there. Okay. But Gandhi would be number one. Um, you know, I was reading his, you know, there have been a few biographies of his, but one of the first and still one of the best was by an American journalist named Louis Fisher. And he went to cover Gandhi's independence campaign and followed him around and, and met with him a couple of times. And I thought, yeah, if I was born, you know, 50, 70 years earlier, I would have been that, you know, New York Times journalist going to Gandhi's ashram in Gujarat and having an audience with him and asking him questions. Um, so he'd be at the top of the list. Mm, yeah, I can understand that. Okay, well, that's your 10 best list. Now let's talk about you. Oh. Philosophical traveler, recovering malcontent, spiritual voyeur, grump, confusionist, mm. bag collector, and or, as the New York Times book review described you, Woody Allen channeling Karen Armstrong. How would you <laughs> most like to be remembered? I mean, what would you put on your epitaph? You know, Benjamin Franklin was many things, um, but his epitaph, he said, just put B. Franklin Printer um, because he was a, he was a printer. Um, that was his trade, how he first earned his first money, and he remained a printer all his life. And um, I, I think Traveler in the broadest sense. Um, maybe seeker, but that sounds a little, a little presumptuous. Um, I, I would go with traveler and enthusiast um, for life. But, Not a um, confusionist anymore. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I mean, I am confused um, and I still um, attend the church of confusionism. Um, but uh, I think traveler in the broadest sense, um, traveling across ideas as well yes, as places. Yeah. So you're not just. Yeah. You're not, and you're, you're um, not your average traveler. Right. But um, travel at its best is an intellectual journey, spiritual journey, in addition to being a physical journey. And you can be a traveler who doesn't leave their house, in my mind, as well, if you have the right books. Um, so it's, it's a mindset. Um, a recovering malcontent is a is a perennial project, um, so that's 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 always there. Um, I think uh, a lot of humorous um, comedians uh, have a dark side, um, and oh, yes. I'd, be, I'd be part of that group as well. Yeah. So it's yeah. you know, it feels like it's almost necessary. <laughs> you know? Well, I think uh, if you want to. You know, bring light into the world you have to start off with darkness as your raw material and you, you try to convert the darkness into light mm. i think that's what a humorous comedian does um to tra transform the darkness if everything is all light you have no work to do <laughs> um so yeah mm. how did you feel about that um uh, description of you, Woody Allen, Allen channeling Karen Armstrong. Did you take that as a compliment? Uh, well, Woody Allen's had some things to his reputation, but the idea of that, um, yeah, I've also people have said, um, you know, uh, Dave Barry, who's a humorist, uh, meets Malcolm Gladwell, who's a serious writer. Um, if the idea is a a deeply serious person meets a deeply funny person yeah uh, i like that and 
and humor, I mean, humor can serve two functions, I think. It can, people can use it to conceal the truth. You just you make a joke about something when you get, you know, if you're sitting in with your therapist or your priest and, you know, they're talking to you about a problem, you make a joke about it, you might be doing that just to get away from the subject. They're getting too close to the bone. But that, that's one function of humor. Another function is to shed light uh, on, on the truth, to reveal, un, unveil the truth. And you can reveal truths through humor that you may not be able to do otherwise. <clears throat> and, and I think that's humor at its best. Um, there's also nothing less funny than talking about funny. That's, you know, pe people who analyze, academics who analyze humor, they're a very dry, boring bunch. Um, yes. And so there's a, you know, a certain amount of magic that goes on. I, I don't think that comedians and humorists necessarily could explain exactly what they're doing or how they do it even. But I, I do, it does, I've given it some thought and I think that humor can be either something to conceal the truth or to reveal the truth. And, you know, I, I try to do the latter in my books, use it as a way to reveal the truth or in a self-deprecating way to show the reader that I'm a slob just like you. And I may have read all these books and traveled to all these places, but I'm no better than you. In fact, look at this silly thing I just did. Um, and if that's not proof, then watch the silly thing I'm about to do now. <laughs> um, and it, it diffuses the yeah. inherent tension between author and reader. It gets you in the door, I think. Absolutely. So, Man Seeks God, Geography of Bliss, um, Geography, Geography of, of Genius, genius and, and the Democracies also, Express. Yeah. Which, which one did you have the most fun writing? The most fun? Fun. I thought you were going to say which one was the most successful or which one was. Um, oh, boy. Um, that, that's, that's like saying, who's your favorite child? Um, <sighs> you must have a little sneaking fondness when you think about them. Yeah. I mean, Man, Man Seeks Guy, which we've discussed is, is, you know, maybe because it's been a few years now, but that was, that was fun. I, I felt that there wasn't, uh, a, so much a body of knowledge to acquire um, because it was religions and spiritual traditions, I was more dipping into ways of being. I was certainly reading about Taoism and Christianity, but unlike um, my books on, on, um, on places of genius or even on the philosophers and Socrates Express, it was probably the most experiential book. Mm. Um, and um, and for whatever reason, did not do as well as some of the others, because I, I, I do think that religion and spirituality, they're difficult subjects to write about because people are either true believers and they want to hear their beliefs bolstered and reinforced, or they're another kind of true believer, atheists, who are convinced it's all a bunch of hogwash and they want to have that certainty um, certified, if you will, by the author. <clears throat> Being a Confucianist or a possibilian, someone in between, like myself and maybe like other people out there listening, it's it, it, it's hard to I think to to reach those people, and and yet they're probably the majority of people. Um, but they're less inclined to maybe pick up a book on spirituality because it's like, oh, you know, that book has the word God in it. I'm not going there. Um, well. Philosophy and happiness, particularly happiness, is is a safer subject. Everybody wants to be happy. Yeah, yeah. Everybody wants to know the secret. And talking about that, which is the happiest place? I mean, we hear about Bhutan all the time, but did you find that was true, or is this somewhere uh, else? Well, um, you're as you're saying you want me to give away the the ending of the book of where I reveal the happiest place. Um, look, statistically which means the researchers go out and they ask people in these countries one simple question, overall, how happy would you say you are these days on a scale of one to 10? One being miserable, 10 being just happy overall, not like this moment in time, but assessing your life. And consistently, um, some Nordic countries like Finland, Denmark, Iceland are right at the top, you know, um, 
former Soviet republics are, are right at the bottom, even before the recent troubles. Um, Sub-Saharan African countries like Tanzania also at the bottom where basic needs are not being met in many cases. Um, but I, I think we, we, we can be happy in a variety of places. We don't have to all travel to Iceland. Um, you know, we can, um, we can import, that's the point of this book is that we can import these, um, these happy places internally. Um, I think if we all moved to Iceland, it would first of all become a less happy place with all, our, all these unhappy Brits and Americans moving there. Um, so, you know, I'd like to say any place can be happy. I don't think that's necessarily true, but a lot of places have the raw materials. Um, mm. When did you write that book? That was my first book. In, in, um, well, I researched it in 2006, 2007. It came out in January 2008, I believe. Um, have you been back it, to check on Slough? And its happiness level? Um, I, I, I have not. Um, how is Slough doing? Oh, do you know, this is not a place I visit very often. <laughs> so every country pretty much has their Slough. You know, we have New Jersey. Um, you have uh, you have Slough, and, it, and it's, it's unfair to these places. It's really yeah. Slough is just a perfectly fine little town, you know. But yeah. but there was a poet named John Benjamin who who wrote nasty things about Slough, and then the office decided to film you know, their sad office life, you know, in, in Slough. But what I found interesting is when the BBC hired a team of happiness experts to try to make Slough happier. Can you take an unhappy place and make it happy? Um, so I've not been back to Slough, um, but I've been back to some of the other places I've visited, like India. And, and the, the, uh, as I get older, I find that I begin tend to begin my sentences with the phrase, as I get older. I never used to do that. But now I do it all the time. And I would say, as I get older, I have less of a desire to see more new places and check those off whatever list I might have um, and to return to places I've been. Mm -hmm. um, just like with, kind of with the books, you know. Um, I'm still reading new books, but there's something nice about having this menagerie of books, you know, that you can return to and places that, that change every year, change just enough, you know, that when you go there, you know, some things are different, but, but you have a relationship, a pre-existing relationship with it. Hmm. Well, in the few minutes that we have left, tell us about the writing workshops that you lead, because they are quite original and they're in a very interesting place. Yes. Um, well, I, I, one is less interesting. I lead a, a workshop every October, uh, late October in Flagstaff, Arizona, at elevation 7,000, 8,000 feet, whatever that is in meters, um, with uh, a fellow author, Jackie Leiden. And um, that's open to all writers, including aspiring ones. The one I think you're speaking of is the Himalayan Writing Workshop, which I co-founded with my friend James Hopkins some six, seven years ago, um, mostly had in Kathmandu, along with myself and other writers during different times of the year. But we, two years ago, we had plans to hold it in Bhutan and we still have those plans. <laughs> and uh, we are now on track uh, for our October uh, 3rd through 13th, I believe the dates are, um, in Bhutan, which is a Himalayan country sandwiched between India and China. Uh, it's the country with the policy of gross national happiness. And this... Uh, workshop is going to be part workshop, part C, Bhutan. So we do lots of journaling, writing, free writing, where you just start writing and you don't pick up your pen. Maybe you've done this and just longhand, just keep going. Even if you get stuck, you keep going. We do some of that and we work toward finished pieces too. And uh, and we'll read Italo Cavino and, and get inspiration from some of the greats. And we'll see Bhutan, which... You know, I said earlier, I wish I was born, you know, 50, 100 years earlier and I could be a real explorer. But there's still places on this planet like Bhutan where you feel like you are really someplace else. And it, it, it is a special place. So last question. What are you reading now? <sighs> oh, boy. <coughs> uh uh I'm looking over there. Well, I know you read several at once. Yes. Like me. 
<laughs> uh, I, a Short History of Progress by, I believe it's Ronald Wright, W-R-G-H-T, I think that's his name, um, which is an interesting take, um, taking this whole idea of the, uh, of the notion of progress and examining it from, you know, Paleolithic times right up to tomorrow, actually. Uh, we don't normally think of progress uh, as an idea. We just think that it's a, it's a given and it's not always been the case. And in the idea of progress, especially technological progress, is a fairly recent invention. I'm quite interested um, in that. Um, I'm rereading Neil Postman's Building a Bridge to the 18th Century, about what we can learn from the 18th century. Um, you know, and then I'm reading a, a, a William Boyd novel, Ordinary Thunderstorms. Um, he's one of my favorite authors. Um, I'm also about to start a Martin Amos, uh, again, short novel called Time's Arrow, uh, in which he tells the story in reverse chronology. And uh, I'm reading it because I'm looking for ideas of, you know, how to structure my next book and this idea of telling the, a life story from end to beginning quite fascinates me. Um, so I try to always have at least one book that's not work related. It's not research for what I'm working on something. And it might be a novel, but it might be just something fun. And it, you know, it gets, gets the juices flowing. It's Eric Weiner. Thank you for adding your 10 best list to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. And thank you for writing such brilliant, thoughtful, very, very funny books that make me laugh. A joy to read a book that makes me laugh. <laughs> if you can make a Brit laugh, you know you've done something right. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Thank you much, very much, Sandy. I really enjoyed the conversation and you asked some questions I've never heard before and I thought I heard them all. So thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. That's it. Um, you can learn more about Eric Weiner's books, articles, writing workshops and speaking appearances at his website, ericweinerbooks.com, where you can also sign up for his newsletter. And I heartily recommend that. And I certainly recommend his books. I'm having great fun with them. Before we close, as the spiritual market becomes increasingly crowded, it is becoming ever more challenging to sort the wheat from the chaff, which is why we launched the No BS Spiritual Book Club, so that we could provide you with trusted recommendations from authors, teachers, speakers, and others who've walked this path before you. So you can check out the free Spiritual Books Archive at the website, No bsspiritualbookclub.com. You can also view previous episodes of this interview series and you can add your name to our Save My Space list to get last minute reminders of upcoming episodes. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of our 10 best interviews. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>